Friends, diners, Wisconsinites, and Cubans, welcome. Welcome to um, our Seasonal Chef program, Seasonal Chef Meets Mystery to Me Bookstore for National Library Week. And um, I have a quick, few quick announcements, but I can't tell you how excited we are to um, be able to offer a program with Mystery to Me, two wonderful authors, Joanne and Chef Joel, intrepid Chef Joel. Chef and reader. Okay, so, um, but first, because it's National Library Week, I have to tell you about a very special um, contest and celebration that our library hosts, and it's called What's on the Menu, because if you've come to Seasonal Chef, it's always about the food, right? So, um, we have a number of wonderful local eateries, uh, Gail Ambrosius, Madison Sourdough, The Pizza Oven, Swad, Steenbox, Willie Street Co-op, um, and The Pizza Oven, and Culver's. And they've all donated gift certificates to us for this week. And so we've taken library displays and we've turned them into menu courses. So for appetizers, we put up Madison Sourdough. For desserts, we have Gail Ambrosius. And then we have kind of themed um, books around them, so of course, for desserts, there's a lot of men in kilts without shirts, but that's a, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Um, so if you bring in your library card, and you don't have to be a Monona library card holder, any one of 50 libraries in seven um, counties in south central Wisconsin, and you check out anything this week, you uh, will get a little slip at the front desk that looks like this, and you put your name on it and the date and your phone number, and then you place it in one of those boxes, and at the end of the week, you might get a drawing for one of these. So we hope everyone plays, and you can play once a day, and just come in anyway and check out materials, because <laughs> that makes us all feel, feel wonderful. Um, so I want to first uh, very quickly well, I was going to introduce Chef Joel, but I would think I'll let Chef Joel introduce himself because he's much more eloquent than I am. We've been working with um, Chef Joel for about at least six years, right? Oh, it seems longer than that. Yeah. I, I mean, mean not. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> for an eternity, <laughs> an eternity. Uh, and uh, he is a wonderful chef. Uh, great sense of humor, he teaches classes, and when we thought of this particular program where you would be reading two books and then interpreting them into food, Chef Joel was the first person who came to mind. How many of you have been here and heard me speak before? I, just, if I, can, I was wondering if I could do the same shtick if I had to come up with something new. <laughs> so, um, it's uh, wonderful to be back here, I, I love it. All I do is teach cooking. For those of you that don't know that, I don't work in a restaurant anywhere. I've done the pastry chefing, the personal chefing, where you put food in people's refrigerator and then they eat it during the week. The thing I didn't like about that um, was the phrase, it was good, but. So it's like, I, so it's like, so but make it yourself is what I told them. So I quit doing that. Um, and then catering, you know, catering, you have to be so nice to people or oftentimes being really stupid is the best way to put it. Um, and so I quit doing catering. Private chefing, I thought that was going to be the key to my dreams, where I was working for a family. And I worked for a family, did two seven-course meals a day. And they let me go because they were getting fat. <laughs> so, um, it, so I won't tell you what nationality they were, um, because it doesn't matter, but it was really fun. They didn't speak English. Um, so I didn't know if they liked the food except for the talking that came or did not come from the dining room. And then I hear the interpreter, chef. So the craziest part about that is when Mrs. found a lump in her potato. So I made mashed potatoes, but I didn't rice them. I mashed them by hand, and then there was a lump in the potatoes. So I started making instant potatoes, and they loved them. <laughs> so, which goes back into, thing, back into catering, what people are kind of stupid. So, um, but uh, all I do is teach cooking. I'm lucky enough to do that, and I'm glad to be here. So there you go. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Joanne from Mystery to Me. And um, it's uh, great to do another program with Tony. She's awesome. So, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, so I have a quote here, and it says, food is not just sustenance. It's a way of opening up entire worlds and new cultures in your kitchen. Um, it's a quote by a popular food blogger, Molly Yeh, and I think it's very appropriate for tonight's event. 
Um, because just like food can open up your mind uh, to various cultures and worlds, um, so can books. So, um, so travel with us a little bit tonight. <laughs> uh, we have two wonderful authors. Um, Teresa Double Page is uh, the author of the new book, Death Comes In Through the Kitchen, um, and Nick Petrie, who's here with us uh, with his new book, Light It Up. Um, Teresa is a Cuban writer. She was born in Havana, but left in 1996 for the United States, where she's been living ever since. She obtained her PhD in Latin American literature from the University of New Mexico, and she teaches English, and English as a second language and Spanish at the uh, New Mexico Junior College. Her bio tells us that she's been writing since she was a teenager. And her first novel, titled A Girl Like Che Guevara, was published by Soho Press in 2004. And it was written in English, which is saying quite a lot for someone <laughs> who hadn't been in the States for very long. So that's, that's quite a deal. Um, she's written several other novels in Spanish and English, many of them winning awards. And she turned to mystery, one of my favorite topics, in 2016, and now has published this incredible book, with a variety of very interesting characters. If you read this book, and I strongly suggest you do, Padrino is um, the Santero detective. And a Santero is, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong when you're speaking, but it's kind of like a religion around like voodoo kind of thing, the sort of Cuban variety. Um, very interesting, and she can tell us more. And then another character is Matt Sullivan, who's a reporter who comes to Cuba to meet up with a food blogger, Yarmia Portal. Um, Publishers Weekly calls this book, says in their review, that this is a dazzling culinary mystery. Um, I loved it. There's times when I laughed out loud. Um, I got to know Havana a little bit, and uh, that was fun because I was there this year, so that was, that was great. And it's a very compelling murder mystery set in a place I didn't know a lot about, so that's, it was really fun. So we'll look forward to that. Nick Petrie is here, and he's been here before with his Peter Ash novels. Um, a lot of people have compared uh, Lee, um, Peter Ash to Lee Child's Jack Reacher. I personally think that Peter Ash is better than Jack Reacher. <laughs> um, Nick received his MFA in fiction from the University of Washington, and he won a Hopwood Award for short fiction while an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. And his first novel, The Drifter, which we have a few copies over there, um, won the 2016 Thriller Award and the 2016 Barry Award for Best First Novel. He was nominated for a 2016 Edgar Award, an Anthony Award, and for Best First Novel, as well as the 2016 Hammett Prize for Best Novel. So you're missing out if you don't read these two award-winning books, let me just say. Um, he was also named one of Apple's 10 Writers to Read in 2017, and he won the 2016 Literary Award from the Wisconsin Library Association. Are you blushing yet? No. <laughs> His books in the Peter Ash series are The Drifter, Burning Bright, and Now Light It Up. So um, Nick is a husband and a father. He's worked as a carpenter, a remodeling contractor, and a building inspector. And I think we can all safely say that now his profession is writer. <laughs> um, Nick comes to us from Milwaukee. So a little bit about Light It Up. Um, it's an action-packed thriller. Tony just told me she didn't go to sleep last night because she was <laughs> finishing it. Um, and it wasn't because I wasn't sleeping. It was so exciting. I know. <laughs> afterwards. It was like running a great, great adventure. Okay, I'll stop. Oh, so, stop now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this book in the Peter Ash series finds Peter in Colorado helping his old friend Henry Nygaard's heavy metal protection team deliver a truckload of medical marijuana to Denver area shops. If you don't know a lot about the medical marijuana and the whole marijuana legalization stuff that's going on in the world, this book is a good teacher. <laughs> um, later on, a mountain road, the hijackers ham ambush a truck and they seize the money collected in Denver. And there's only one team member that survived. Guess who that was? Peter Ash. And he's going to avenge what happened to his friends. And I can't wait to hear more from these guys. So with that.
Oh, Tony reminds me that I'm a bookseller. She's a librarian where you can check out books and you don't have to pay for them. I'm a bookseller. Um, and the books are over here. And after uh, everybody is done talking with you tonight, uh, we would love for you to come by and purchase some of these authors' books because they love to sign them too. <laughs> so this book started in my mind around two years ago when my mother reminded me of the many recipes that my grandma used to make in Cuba. And they were all kind of traditional Cuban recipes like arroz con picadillo. I think anybody knows arroz con picadillo? Is a rice, you see? Sí. ¿Qué es arroz con picadillo? Es arroz con picadillo. Pero es el picadillo. <laughs> 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 uh, picadillo, I, as I understand it, is sort of a um, not very spicy sort of tomato salsa, fresh tomato salsa. Sí, con carne, with meat. That's very good. It's una salsa. First you make the sauce, tomato sauce, and then you incorporate the meat. Ground beef es el picadillo. So, but my grandma always added a special twist to all the uh, traditional Cuban foods. So my mother said, I'm hit up with this. We're going to lose all this if nobody takes the time to write them down. I'm not going to do it. So I said, bueno, first I thought, maybe I should write a cookbook. But so I said, who's going to buy a cookbook from me? I mean, I don't even cook that well, according to my husband. So I said, <laughs> hazme el favor. Pero dije, bueno, there is interest in Cuba. No, that was two years ago. And Cuba had been in the news and all that. So Maybe I could write a novel that takes place in Cuba. And well, you know, okay. Entonces, the idea was how do I weave in the recipes in the novel? So, you know, the recipes are there forever and people get to enjoy them. And I thought maybe a mystery. I had never written a mystery and I have never studied um, writing formally. So I did the best I could. It's my first mystery. Espero que les gusten. Hope that you don't get too bored, because I am not sure if I follow the rules. Um, there are rules, no? Well, kind of. It helps to know the rules, but then you can break them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 bueno, mijo, I, I broke them before knowing them, so we'll see what <laughs> came out of there. Pero bueno, so I decided to have a Santero detective, because it could be something exotic, the Cuba, no? What kind of detective I'm going to have? Well, Santero. And Santeria is, um, as you have very well said, is a Cuban voodoo. It's a um, mix of Catholicism and African beliefs. The African gods and goddesses are called the Orishas. Entonces, bueno, my detective is a practitioner of Santeria that has also become a private eye to make ends meet. Y bueno, el libro es muy sencillo. Yo creo que es bastante simple. De, the plot is very simple. Um, It's an American who goes to Cuba to marry a Cuban girl, Yarmila. And here, for writing the book, I took a little bit of my own history because I married an American. That's how I came to the United States. But it, the character is not me because she dies like on the first 20 pages. <laughs> But entonces, pero bueno. La comida, the food comes because she's a food blogger. That's how Matt gets to meet her through her blog. And throughout the chapters, you have several Cuban recipes. I think I have like 12 or 15. And they are real. I mean, they are authentic Cuban recipes. I took the time to prepare them at home and to eat the food before I put them in the book. So, <laughs> más o menos. Sometimes I wasn't too sure of the measurements. No, entonces ponía un poquito, a little bit, una pizca, just a tiny bit. Entonces, bueno. Uh, so this is what the book is all about. This American Matt goes to Cuba, he finds his fiance dead, and he is considered a person of interest by the Cuban police. So he's not allowed to leave Cuba until the um, mystery is solved. And um, he hires Padrino, the Santero detective, to solve the case. And in the meantime, he has the whole Cuban experience. A paladar, a paladar is a private restaurant. Casa Particular is like a private hotel. And well, at the end, the mystery is solved. So that's what my book is all about. And I was just telling a friend, if it didn't make me a better writer, it made me a better cook. Así que estoy muy contenta. OK, bueno, aquí tienes. Perfecto. Well, that sounds fascinating. Um, so I, I write. Um, 
the series of, of crime novels about a guy named Peter Ash, um, who's a Marine Corps veteran who is trying to adjust to his life after his war. He's got post-traumatic stress uh, that takes the form of claustrophobia. Um, he calls it the white static. It makes it hard, obviously, for him to be inside for long periods of time. Um, it's a much more interesting uh, calamity or, 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 or uh, dysfunction for a person to have uh, than to be uh, agoraphobic, because it wouldn't be, for me, a very interesting book if the guy could never go outside. Um, <laughs> so it, that was really why I, I, I chose uh, that sort of a challenge to give my guy. Um, this book in particular, as Tony, uh, I'm sorry, as uh, Joanne said, is, is set in Colorado. Each of these uh, novels takes place in, in a different location um, because I have a very short attention span um, and, and I like to, to travel. So this one takes place in Colorado and I, I chose Colorado because it's really, when I began writing, was really at the cusp of this giant social experiment, which is the legalization of cannabis. Um, and um, I, I'm interested in social issues, and I thought this was a, a, a wonderful thing to explore. Um, and there are a couple of things that nudged me in this direction. I, I, uh, I was in an airport in Phoenix on tour for my first book, The Drifter, um, and I was early for a flight, which, which never really happens. Um, so I sat and got a cup of coffee, and I was you know, writing in my little journal, and, 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 um, and I struck up a conversation with this guy who was on his way to Portland. And I said, well, now, why are you going to Portland? And he said, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm starting a, 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 a cannabis operation in Portland. It was going to be legal in six months. And he was, you know, you know getting, uh, you know, the, the advance work done on the facility. Um, and I, 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 thought, I said, well, now, why did you, you know, how is it that, that this is what you're doing? Um, where do you get the skills for this? And, and I thought maybe he was a, you know, he, he was a, a, a botanist. He'd started in the hothouse industry or something. And, and he, he said, no, no, I, this will just be my first legal cannabis grow. <laughs> um, so I, we had quite an interesting conversation after that. Um, and, and that along with um, an article in the New York Times, which was really about how uh, military veterans were working with security companies to help protect these new cannabis entrepreneurs. That was the other piece of this story that kind of figured out how I could, you know, take these two threads and put them together to tell something that, that was interesting. Um, because that's really my, the, the, the thing that drives uh, this work, uh, uh, certainly up through this book, is the lives of veterans. Um, so um, this book starts, um, are we reading? Are we doing? What? Um. Yes, you want to. All right. I think we should really just to keep the time short readings if that's okay, and then at the very end if there's a little bit. Well, I've got about five minutes. I can do. I can keep yammering, or I can read, or I can do whatever. I was looking at our schedule. It was part of our schedule, you know. I'm sorry, I've never made a more like we have the sound in nano <laughs> It's really. S <laughs> <laughs> it works too. <laughs> it's good. So, um, <laughs> Just move it up right along, and then we'll go to Jeff. Um, Jeff. Chef. 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 I can call this. That's normal. That's nice. Okay. It would be lovely to have a short reading, and then when you hear the giant gongs. All right. All right. <laughs> um, so, well, this is just from the first chapter. It's the end of a long, hot September day in Denver, uh, and Peter is part of this four-man crew, heavily armed and a big pickup truck on a cash run for the security company. He's doing a favor for his friend Henry, and it's only his third day uh, on the job. Uh, How much are we carrying, Peter asked, when Deacon pulled away from the curb. A bad question, said Deacon, his brown hands steady on the wheel. Deacon's father was a preacher in the Mississippi Delta country who had had great hopes for his son's religious calling. Deacon told Peter he'd only heard the call of the army, one of the few ways for a black man to find his way out of the Deep South. He hadn't looked back since. We don't guard it because of its value, Henry said over the seat back. We guard it because it's our honor to do so. Henry was over 70 years old, although you'd never think it to look at him, standing tall, his shoulders broad and square, a stubby Honduran cigar unlit in the corner of his mouth. His voice was a hoarse whisper, but it just made the other men lean in closer to hear him. Plus, plus Banjo said with a grin, y'all ain't tempted if y'all don't know what you're carrying. Banjo was the youngest of Henry's crew, maybe 25. He had a thick Appalachian drawl and took a lot of good-natured shit for being from Kentucky. Can I say that on television? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to be authentic. 
Um, his real name was Dave, he'd told Peter when they met, but all these assholes call me Banjo. He'd smiled when he'd said it, not minding the nickname, glad to belong in this group of capable men working together. Peter was glad, too. He didn't mind the war, but he did miss the guys. And part of him, although he didn't like to admit it, really missed suiting up and rolling out with his platoon every day, armed to the teeth and looking for a fight, scared shitless and thrilled to his bones. There's a lot of profanity in here. <laughs> <laughs> Trusting your guys with your life while they trusted you with theirs. There was nothing else like it. But he was hopeful that he'd found something different. He had an invitation to visit a woman named June Cassidy in Washington State in a few weeks' time, an invitation he'd worked hard to get. No way in hell he was going to miss it. Let me skip forward a little bit here. Uh, so they were sending this, uh, this client's uh, money up to uh, a spot in the mountains. Um, the grower ran two big facilities and sold wholesale to dozens of resellers. He owned a legacy parcel deep in the steeps of the Arapaho National Forest. <laughs> According to Henry, the small cabin was set way back in the tall pines off a long gravel road, itself turning off a narrow county highway cut into the sloped side of a creek drainage. It seemed like a, a safe place for a cash stash. The roads empty enough that it was easy to tell if someone was tracking them, although it was more difficult at night. The county highway didn't have guardrails, just tall rocks on one side and a long drop on the other. The light was fading. Henry had the Deacon had the pedal down, pushing the limits of the truck and the road. Henry sat in the front passenger seat, Banjo and Peter in the back. The sun had dropped below the serrated horizon, and they were all ready to be done with this long day. A half mile ahead on the highway, a boxy ambulance grumbled slowly up the grade. The red and white paint seemed dim in the fading light, or maybe the ambulance was just old. The diesel rattle of its engine got louder in the thin air as Deacon came up fast behind. The mountain rose hard and lumpy on their left. On the right, the slope fell away sleepy, steeply, disappearing into treetops, the highway too narrow for passing. Deacon took his foot off the gas. Our turn's up here, said Henry. Gravel Road, just past the next switchback. Oh, let me skip a little here. Peter felt his momentum slip, shift as Deacon started the truck around the tight curve. The diesel sound of the ambulance changed ahead of them, getting softer. The ambulance slowing, coming to a stop at the wide spot just before the intersection. Man, get out of my way, said Deacon, shaking his head. That's my damn turn. He tapped the horn, hit the gas, and swung wide to get around the big boxy van. Peter figured the other driver had thought it was a good place to let them by, until the ambulance pulled forward sharply, and Peter saw the big red wrecker roaring toward them down the gravel road. Too fast to stop, too late to miss. Peter knew immediately the impact was inevitable. He didn't have time to brace himself or call out to the others. The wrecker's heavy front grille was suddenly huge in the passenger side window. Then it T-boned them hard enough to knock Henry's big four-door pickup all the way across the road and into the drainage ditch. Peter was on the far side of the impact behind the driver. He was thrown forward and toward the wrecker. His seat belt yanked him like a dog on a leash. Then he bounced back hard against his door. He was trying to hang on to his rifle when the side of his head hit the window hard enough to star the glass. The truck's nose dug into the backside of the ditch with a rending crunch, and Peter was thrown forward again. He blinked off the sparkles and tried to move, but was trapped by his seat belt. He fumbled for the button. He could see the white puffballs of the airbags inflated in the front seat. All the while, his mind was trying to picture the geometry. The red wrecker had come at them from a side road at high speed. It would have been hard enough to do on purpose, nearly impossible, by accident. With the amount of money they were carrying, Peter knew this was no accident. There would have to be another vehicle, somebody ahead of them, or behind, or both. Hey, he called to the other men. His voice sounded odd. He wondered how hard he'd hit his head. Hey, he said again, they're coming. Get ready. So that's part of the first chapter. <laughs> That was a very gratifying ooh, by the way. I appreciate that. Okay. Maybe I can tell you a little bit more about the recipes if you like to cook. Um, I used original recipes in my book, but I modified them. So if you look for a Cuban cookbook, uh, there is one called cooking in minutes, cocina al minuto, and it is translated into English, I believe. And then you read my recipes. They are a little different, está bien? So you are going to 
if you compare, then you're going to notice some differences. I added a lot more spice to my recipes because Cuban food is not spicy. I don't know if you have heard about chile habanero. El chile habanero is very spicy. Bueno, I don't know where they got the habanero part because in Cuba we don't even know chile. We don't use it at all. We, we use um, pimientos verdes, green peppers. Pero bueno, so I added a lot of spice to my recipes after living for almost 10 years in Taos. And these are some of the twists and tricks that I have in my recipes, you know, adding a chile, um, frying things with olive oil instead of lard. In Cuba, we don't use olive oil at all. Todo se fríe en la manteca. Everything is fried in lard. But I made it more um, like healthy stuff. Entonces, bueno, pues that's all I have to say about my recipes. Y ojalá que les gusten. Provecho. Bon appetit. <laughs> Me? Cool. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the inspiration in, in reading the books. It's fun to read a book and take notes on any, every time food is mentioned. That's how I approach it when I'm, when I'm trying to come up with ideas. So um, a couple of years ago when we did it, Nick, there was a few. Uh, you, you've pared down your food references quite a bit in this book. There was like four or three. Um, so it was a little more challenging to uh, come up with something until I thought of the obvious, which is you'll find in a second, um, or you'll, unless you've already looked, which is fine. Um, but of course, Teresa's was just amazing. It's like I had like three pages of notes of stuff that she mentioned, and and that's not even including the stuff I didn't know what it was. Cause, cause <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so that was that was uh, that was a little bit more daunting. But it, be it became pretty clear um, to what I wanted to. I usually, I'm a I'm a savory chef. I like to cook meat and sauce, starch, vegetables, I like uh, entrees and things like that. I ended up going both desserts tonight, or both sweet, sweets tonight. So what I did with, um, with Nick's book, I came up with, with pot brownies. <laughs> of course, right? So, there's, um, so if you notice on the, on the handout that, that you were given from me, it's a pot in parentheses, uh, because you can use a pot to make them. <laughs> okay, you know, so I thought I can get away with it that way. Um, so if you need a recipe for pot brownies, I'm sure there's one online. <laughs> 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 Or just you know talk to your neighbor or something like that. <laughs> so um, and then what I did with uh, in Trace's book was uh, she had written part of part of the without giving the the story away. There was a lot of uh, there was a blog um, a chef's blog at the, the at the end of each of the chapters and most of the chapters, and one of them was about banana bread. And I have a killer recipe for banana bread, so I made banana bread. I thought that was kind of fun. And so it's banana bread, pot brownies, and then the, co the uh, combat coffee came back again in this book, which I think is wonderful. It's a couple packs of instant coffee with a slosh of water in your mouth. That's combat coffee, right, yeah. essentially? <laughs> it works, too. Well, <laughs> it's, the, it's, a, it's a water bottle that's been left out in the sun, so it's warm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, are we cold? I tried it cold. It's pretty good cold too. You know, a lot. Yes. So anyway, so that's so I did a coffee sauce, a cold coffee sauce, um, in homage to that. So that's where it came up. Um, those two things. Um, so, but and also too the blogs. Um, well, not the blogs, but what I what, what talking with Joanne and talking with Tony, uh, we talked about the concept of a red herring. And so that's kind of what I have going on in this pan right here. The onions um, that you might have gotten the aroma when you came in. When I used to do a lot of demos um, out east in like Bloomingdale's and different stores, um, I would, and when I was private chefing for those folks, if I was running late, the first thing I would do is put onions and butter on the stove. Because then like, okay, chef's here. And also in a, because in a, in a, then like, hey, they, they wouldn't be looking for me and trying to figure out where I was. And also in a store, it's like a magnet. It brings people down just like the, the aroma of, and I don't like to use the word smell when it's about something positive. A really good friend of mine um, got me to use the word aroma instead of a smell because you never think of, like a, when you're picking up your, after your dog, you never think of aroma, it's a smell. <laughs> But when you're thinking about onions and garlic and that kind of stuff, so it's more of an aroma. So I always put the onions on first, and it, it was a magnet. And oftentimes people would say, like, what are you using the onions for? And it's like, just to get you here. It was just, it's just like, and it worked, you know. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to be serving any onions tonight, but we're making, I'm making what's called a sofrito, which is a, in, it's a total, um, one of the base bases of most of, or a lot of dishes in, in Cuba and Spanish food and things like that. It starts with onions. I know she mentioned green pepper, but I happen to have some of these tiny, nice little peppers, which are just a really cool product, you know, which is um, one of the most wonderful things these days to have um, because they keep so well in the fridge as well. And just, you can just, my daughter just loves nibbling on them and munching on them and you can stuff them and do all sorts of stuff with these little peppers. And garlic, for those of you that have heard me talk about this before, 
This is a head of garlic and this is a clove of garlic. Um, I say that because I've had people in the years that I've been teaching use this as a clove of garlic. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I know this woman came up one time, she asked if, and it was like a, a comic strip or like a cartoon, you could just see her breath, like those little curly <laughs> things that come out. You know, she's like, do you have any more garlic? You know, and it's like, yeah, we put garlic on your counter. She's like, yeah, we used that whole clove you gave us. And it's like, yes, you did. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, so what I do with the garlic, because this is the head, so you take the clove, and I'm just going to sh show you, when in doubt, show some knife skills, at least you pick something up that way. Oh, here, I got this thing going too. This is the caramel sauce. What's in here is sugar, and the water's pretty much evaporated, and I'm going to continue cooking it. While I'm doing everything else, I'm going to turn it into caramel and add some cream to it to make the caramel sauce that you're actually going to enjoy. So to get the garlic, I just use smash it get the skin off. Now one of my pet peeves, those of you that have taken classes and worked with me or whatever, get the garbage off your cutting board. Don't cut with garbage on your cutting board. It's one of my pet peeves. So I always put it off to the side on the table, have a little bowl or something. Some people like to have a little dish or something that they put all their little, you know, compost in. And at home we have compost and we have chicken food. And when I do classes, I have the people trained, like, is it, can chickens eat this? And they put it in one thing because I come home with you know, batches of stuff for our chickens. Like, why not? Instead of just throwing it in compost. Now also this, these are sweating. That's one of my favorite things to do with onions instead of sauteing. Can you hear them? That's a little bit loud. That means it's a little bit hot. So I want to turn the heat down. I want them just to get soft, translucent, opaque. You don't usually hear the word or see the word sweat in a recipe. I think people just think it sounds gross or something, like sweat the onions, and you, maybe you don't know what it is, but it says cook the onions until they're soft, translucent, opaque, trying to get them to soften up. So I'm going to take this and smash it. It's garlic here. And I'm just going to cut this down. There's really no technique here that I'm doing with this garlic other than cutting into small pieces. I do a tripod when I'm cooking, when I'm cutting. My ring finger and my little finger are always out of the way. They're not used at all, but I'm doing a tripod holding the food and kind of just cutting small pieces off a big piece. Now this would be chopped garlic. If you ever have a recipe called for chopped garlic, you're putting a stew or you know, chili or something that's going to cook for a long period of time, this is a good size for that. Um, if you have a little bit of salt, and I do, Add a little bit of salt to this, and the salt will act as, act as an abrasive, and I'm just gonna take that and grind it into the cutting board, just pasted garlic. A mortar and pestle does this as well, and so does a um, garlic press, but then you have to clean the garlic press, with, and this, you've already got your cutting board out, so just do it. Now, I don't add garlic when I do onions, because uh, garlic burns at a lower temperature than onions do, so you could burn your onions or your garlic while you're trying to sweat your onions. So let me show you that onion technique here. It's a nice shiny olive, I mean a nice shiny onion. I spilled some oil on it. So I'm going to cut the top off. Determine what's the top and what's the bottom. Never cut the bottom part off the onion because it's going to hold the onion together while you make all your cuts. Now we're from Wisconsin, so we're really frugal, right? So you take this and you throw this way. This is garbage or compost, of course. And this part, throw it in a bag and use it for stock. Whenever you need to make stock, you've got like the onion top for that. So I'm going to cut it in half now. And I'm going through cutting the onion in half. So I have two halves. The, the button is on each side. And just set that over there. And I'm going to peel it. I go down a good layer just to get to the point where you can actually do the cutting. I mean, get into where it's nice and nice and uh, it's not woody or papery. So I actually lived in Colorado. So I spent right, right out of college, and I mentioned that in the little thing right there. Right out of college, I moved out to, uh, I lived out in Nettleland, Colorado, which was really fun. So it was really fun to read Nick's book and have a lot of memories of, of being in Colorado. I've never been to Cuba, but I have been, I've, I've had some good Cuban food in Florida. So is that, is that kind of close? It's, it's Cuban-American food, I know. But uh, so it was really fun for me to do both of those. Okay, so I have the cutting board at the edge of the counter, onion at the edge of the cutting board, and I'm going to make a horizontal cut. Now, I'm not, my fingers aren't behind there because I don't want to cut red onions. So they're on top, so if the knife goes scooting through there, you have total control. If something seems hard to cut or seems you know, so unsafe, you're doing, there's got to be a better way to do it. There are very few exceptions. Okay, so I started with sugar and water. The more water that's in there, the longer it takes for it to evaporate to make the caramel sauce. This is in your recipe, in your, in your handout right there. So right now, what's happening is, this, I don't want to tip because I don't, I don't know if you can really see anything there. It's kind of just kind of bubbling. The bubbles get bigger when the water is evaporating. The sugar starts going through the candy stages. Softball, hardball, hard crack, or soft crack, hard crack, all the different temperatures where, where you can, um, where you, 
um, for different stages of making different kinds of candy. Which is before thermometers, what they did is they would dip, have ice water, dip your fingers in ice water, put it in the hot molten sugar, put it back in the ice water, and you could tell what stage it's at. It doesn't hurt at all. It's really exciting. It's, uh, it's really fun <laughs> to do. <laughs> it's a great thing to teach kids, too. I teach kids, and they go home and do that. And it's like, no. So anyway, so what I've got here, back to this. So this, I'm keeping an eye on this, because once it starts turning brown, and a lot of times cooking, for those of you that, that entertain or do different, do different cooking, do you remember the Ed Sullivan show and they had the, the plate turners? Yeah. These <laughs> plate spinners, cooking is a lot like spinning plates where you, the plate starts wobbling, you've got to do something with that. So I'm kind of going between things here. So I'm going to keep an eye on that. And once it starts to get brown, then I'm going to dump in some heavy whipping cream. There is no uh, substitute for heavy whipping cream in this recipe. Find a different caramel sauce if you're looking for locale. So <laughs> I did the horizontal. When some just don't work, it's just some, you know, it doesn't pay to try to do things with, you know, try to adapt. Okay, so I did horizontal. So I'm going to do horizontal with this one. I'm going about halfway back. Nothing more than halfway. Okay, and I'm going to turn it towards me now. And I've got the tip of my knife, and I'm going to stay in the inside of the circumference of that onion, cutting all the way down. So what I've done is I've done horizontal, vertical. So basically made a half a blooming onion. If you soak this and then deep fried it, or you know, battered it and deep fried it, you'd have a half a blooming onion. But, and then I'm going to turn it back the way I started, and I've got dice. So it's horizontal, vertical, and then perpendicular. The onion gets top heavy, wants to tip over, tip it over, and it's impossible to cut onions without having one fall on the floor. Did you know that? <laughs> it's it. And they're not good for dogs, so you have to clean it up to yourself. So, so you're gonna continue cutting, and this is your onions. How to keep yourself from crying? Um, goggles, contacts, a little fan blowing across. A cold onion you know, keeps the fumes from dissipating, but running water, a stick of um, bread in your mouth, a match going, just, or just get the darn thing done. This technique actually just allows you to get it done. <laughs> and, uh, and don't cry about it, just do it. So <laughs> and so here we got this horizontal. So this is what I started with the onions there in that thing. So diced, diced onions. Got a knife skills class. So I've been teaching here. Um, You'll see on your thing, too, we've got quite a few classes coming up, especially a lot of kids' classes coming up. So that's one of my fortes, has been doing kids' classes. But I do a lot of adult classes. I've got some at the Wheelhouse Studios at Union South at the university. So I've got some there. And I've also done a few classes now at Vom Fass on University Avenue. So it's kind of fun. So I've added the garlic. So this is starting to get a little bit brown. Now, if you get, get that. Now, this is a caramel sauce. And oftentimes, you serve it with dessert, of course, right? So desserts are sickeningly sweet oftentimes. So you can actually take this a little bit further and make it slightly bitter, which gives a nice little contrast with the sweet dessert. So you can actually take it to a little bit darker color. Um, so I'll show you that in a second here, too. So these peppers, I cut the top off. Now, I don't throw that away. I just happened to cut it off. I'm just going to work my way around. I just, it just cut it off to make it easier to do this to get pieces. And then you got compost. Cut it in half. And how picky I am, like, there's like three seeds. Well, we've got three little pecks that the chickens can do. So I put it in the chicken pile. You know, my wife's got me trained. That's the pecking order, too. It's, it's my daughter, my, my daughter, my wife, our dog, Star, and then the five chickens, and then me. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> which is fine. It's fair enough, you know, so. So what I cut off the end now, and I'm going to, even though I cut off the ends, but this gives me a slab that makes it easier to cut it into sticks and then to cut those sticks into dice. So the technique is slab, stick, dice. So there. Now, this is starting to smoke a little bit. That's good. So this is a point where, and you want to have your cream. This is not where you want to go to the refrigerator and get your cream. You want to have your cream ready. And you want to pour it in. And do it from the side. And don't put it in. You want a facial. Don't go, oh, well, it looks really cool. <laughs> you know? So you're going to steam it. And now, one thing I did not mention, too, when you're doing caramel sauce, and you're doing anytime you're caramelizing sugar, don't stir it. Don't stir it. Put it. And it says to sometimes wash the sides of the pan down with a brush. Put a lid on it, and then when the water evaporates, hits that lid, it'll, it'll wash the sides of the pan down on, on its own. The reason for not stirring is that you can cause it to uh, create a um, crystallize. It'll turn into a crystal, crystallize, and get those shards. And once it turns into shards, start over. It's only a half a cup of sugar or a cup of sugar, so just start over and go with there. And the other thing, too, if you burn it, just obviously start over. And it's only a half a cup of sugar. Um, so this is a, that's it for caramel sauce. Now, once it's cool, you put this in a squirt bottle and just sit in front of the TV with your light beer, your Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's awesome. It's just like it's, but don't, but don't put this in the, don't put this in a squirt bottle when it's hot because you'll end up with it everywhere. It'll go right through the squirt bottle. 
So what's in, the what's in your little boat? You notice the little flags. We have the little brownie that has the, it's a little cup that has the syrup, syrup on it. And also then you have the, um, the brownie um, that has the caramel sauce. And there's a little fork in there. And uh, if you need a napkin, we can get you a napkin or something. But that's, that's it um, in, terms of the, in terms of the flavors there. Now, when you're making banana bread, I imagine everybody's had a good banana bread is it's the, rotten, the more rotten the banana, the darker, the blacker, the more gross the banana, the better the banana bread. Literally, like in the summer, if you've got fruit flies coming, like if you all of a sudden you realize there's a banana and you've got this black banana, you take it out of the, take it out of the peel, put it in the refrigerator, or put it in the freezer in a bag, and it just, it's just phenomenal. The recipe calls for three bananas. I put up to six or seven bananas in the recipe of rotting, bana rot like talking black and rotten. Not, and they don't really rot. They just totally, they ferment. And, like, I mean, it's kind of a rotting, but it's not gross. You know, so I, I use that all the time. And I use a lot of it, a lot of the bananas, uh, a lot of the rotting bananas. Because um, we always have bananas on hand, and oftentimes they turn. You know, they start turning, so we just put them in a bag and put them in the freezer and, and make bana banana bread. Now the, um, so the, the more ripe the banana, the better, as I just mentioned. Uh, and you can make this, you can exponentially, you can do huge amounts of this. You could do, as much as you're willing to stir, you can increase this recipe to make as many as you want. It took forever to make this, because I just have a 12, p 12 little mini muffins. I had to do, tw you know, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have, I have those really nice pans that hold 24. My wife bought me three of them. I was like, oh, I love you so much. <laughs> so I had four of them, so I could actually do four in the oven at the same time. Um, so when it comes to the, um, the, um, the brownies, you'll notice when you look at the recipe, it calls for a quarter cup of flour. That's it. It's not a typo. So it's, and it, they're really dense. Now, when I used to travel teach, I was lucky enough to teach um, at different places. I used to fly down to San Antonio and teach at Central Market Cooking School in Austin and stuff. And I flew into San Antonio one time, and they were like, they, were, they had a bunch of food prepped for me when I got there. They were like, oh my gosh, sorry, we don't know what the, the brownies turned out like this. I'm like, oh, those are perfect. Sometimes they come out of the pan like they, they're behaving really well. They come out of the pan perfectly. Other times they don't, they crumble. So it's totally awesome no matter what, because if they crumble, you, you don't, I, I don't, I never count on serving these as like a cake brownie. These are definitely not cake brownies. It's more like a really dense chocolate, you know, bar, basically chocolate brownie. You can crumble it over ice cream if it doesn't come out nice. And I've had, you know, a class where I've had five different groups making brownies, and two of them, two out of five, they came out perfectly. The other three stuck and crumbled, and they were still as delicious, so. So there. Um, so any, let's see what else did I want to say? Um, so I hope that I really would encourage you to get the books, because they were really fun. Um, I was lucky enough to, um, um, I actually get a chance to read them because I had to, but I was lucky enough to have this opportunity to read them, I mean, is what I'm saying. And I was, uh, I was, I was really enthralled, especially, um, just didn't really want to put either of them down. It was fun, wanted to see what's going to happen next, like Tony said, so there's, they were really fun. So I want to thank the authors and thank Tony and Joanne for having me back to do this. Or So anything else? Do you want me to? Um, Joel, can you explain, um, I know you might have touched sure. on it. Can I say, can I, can, uh, without giving anything away, can I explain that? There was a blog yeah. that, there was a blog in there and uh, that, that the, 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 the person who, the character that had gotten, the woman that had gotten murdered, murdered, love that word, murder. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> just fun to say. Um, and uh, she uh, had written a blog on brownies and, and it talked about how she had made it in her office building and, and, and Turns out that when the, they went back to find out to find out more about her, the history, there was no kitchen in the office building, and there was no nothing. And she'd never made the the the, uh, the um, banana bread, I should say. They'd never made it, so I thought, well, I'm going to make banana bread. And so I mentioned in there as well that I could, and all there was was a microwave in the in the little room downstairs in the in the current building, that she was supposed to have made this banana bread in. And so I thought, I bet I could even do it in a microwave, because one of my favorite sayings is I can cook anywhere. So uh, I, would, I bet I could make some brownies in a microwave. So that was the, that was the impetus for that. And then the, uh, and I'm always blowing the, what's the, when you take the, the sweetened condensed milk and boil the heck out of it, was it what's that called? The, 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 the sweetened condensed milk where you, you boil it and it turns into caramel, like, is it, what's, yeah, that's it, dulce leche. Yeah. 
So I, I, I was going to do a bunch of that. I thought, well, I have this wonderful caramel sauce recipe. So, because that was a, that was a constant, and we're not a constant, but that was mentioned in the book as well. So I tried to come up with that. And then, of course, the brownie. Um, the other thing that was mentioned was the two uh, burritos, that the breakfast burritos that he had on his way up the mountain to reclaim everything. That was, that was the only inspiration. So I was thinking Southwest, and I was thinking like that. All of a sudden, well, pot brownies. So that was where that came from. And then, uh, the, again, the coffee sauce with, with the, you know, with the uh, combat coffee. So it was a no-brainer to have some kind of, because they have to have a sauce. That's the thing about being a chef. You know, you have a sauce with everything. When I served dinner one time for my wife before we were married, or it was right, right after we were married, I gave it to her, and she's always like, oh, that's great. She loves, she's still to this day just so appreciative. She's like, oh, that looks wonderful and all that. And she didn't say much the time I put the plate in front of her. And I'm like, well, what? You know, what's, what's wrong? She's like, oh, nothing. I said, like, what? She goes, well, where's the sauce? <laughs> 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 so, created a monster.